In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. As I have mentioned a few times over the past few broadcasts, I've recently been going through the book of Judges, and I came across a story recently that I guess I had forgotten some of the details of it, and it's only in a couple chapters in the Bible, and it's never mentioned again, or at least not that I can recall, maybe in reference uh, sometime in Chronicles or something like that. But it's a story about a Levite and his wife. So without going too much into detail, he and his wife are traveling, and they stop by in a town, and through hospitality of a stranger in this town, which is a, tr a town occupied by Benjamites, people of the tribe of Benjamin, they actually take him into this town. And um, in the middle of the night, you see a scenario that's very similar to what happened in Sodom with Lot, that all of a sudden you have men in the middle of the night banging on this person's door saying that they would like him to send out the stranger, send out the person that is lodging in his house that they saw go into his house earlier so that they can, and this is uncomfortable, and I know I usually do a family-friendly show, but this one, if you've got kids, you may want to steer away from this one for right now. The way that this story goes is that the men were banging on his door and asking him to send out the man that was lodging with him so that they could rape him. And that was the reason that they wanted him to come out. The Bible is subtle in this language, but it's still clear that that was the intent by the, the Hebrew verbiage that is used in that story. It's actually the same as the one that is used in Sodom and Gomorrah, where uh, they ask Lot to send out the angels, the strangers that came to visit him. They didn't know they were angels at the time. Uh, to to have their way sexually with them. So this is a really, really horrible thing because it's not just homosexuality, but it would be even worse, forced homosexuality. So you've got the homosexual sin, but then also, and more importantly, you have the sin of, of raping some with one, somebody without their consent going along with this. And it's important to understand the culture in which this took place. Sadly, even though that this would have very clearly been a violation of the law of Moses and it would have been something that would have been horrible for you to do to a stranger because the, the morality of it would have still been wrong, in their culture, it wouldn't have necessarily been something that would be considered wrong. Because back then, even though the law of Moses had come and they should have known better by this point, all the society surrounding Israel their morality was it's wrong to do anything untoward or sexually immoral towards anybody in our tribe. Anybody else is basically fair game. And you see this same, this same sort of mentality reflected in Sodom that you also see reflected here in this story with the Benjamite that once a foreigner comes into town, all right, well, it's okay to do whatever we want to with those guys. You're not allowed to do that to anybody within the city or within the tribe, but somebody comes from out of town, then yeah, have your way with them. That's really the way that societies surrounding Israel at this time would have thought, and unfortunately, despite the fact that this city is a city where Benjamites, children of Israel themselves that should have known the law of Moses dwelled, they had a similar mentality. So what happens is they instead, and this is an incredibly cowardly thing to do, they offer up his wife instead of him for them to have their way with sexually, uh, they refuse, but they wind up sending her out anyway, and they not only rape the woman, but rape her to death. And she is found dead the next day on the threshold of the door of the man that took the, the Levite, the travelers, in for the evening. So, I mean, a, a really gruesome story, and, and when the Levite, the, the priest, sees that she is dead. He does something symbolic, but still, I think, pretty you know, grotesque and, and really makes you cringe, even though it's a story in the Bible. He actually cuts her body up into 12 pieces 
her already dead body. And that represents the 12 tribes of Israel, and he scatters them all over the kingdom. And you'll see the reason that he did that was basically to get everybody's attention. To say to everybody, hey, uh, this is pretty serious. And when they look at this, they say, w w why would someone do that? And then he explains the backstory, what happened with him and how he was abused and how his wife was killed because of the children of Israel, because of the Benjamites that did this to him. So it's a really, really gross and, and grotesque opening to the story. And we'll see that this is how the reaction goes. For this, if I can go ahead and pull up, this is in Judges 20, 12 through 14. So he says, Then the tribes of Israel sent men through the entire tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has taken place among you? Now then, deliver the men up, the worthless fellows in Gib uh, Gibeah, that's the name of the city they were in, that we may put them to death and remove this wickedness from Israel. But the sons of Benjamin would not listen to the voices of their brothers, the sons of Israel. The sons of Benjamin gathered from the cities to Gibba, and to go out to do battle against the sons of Israel. Now this is really interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, you see an actual civil war take place because of this wickedness that was done to one person. And I think that this is a warning that our sins, though not necessarily extreme as this in many cases, it can cause rifts between people who are supposed to be family. Supposed to be either actual flesh and blood family or brothers and sisters in Christ or just our fellow human beings. It can cause problems within them and can have nearly irrevocable consequences for the actions that we take. But I think What's even more significant about this is that if you understand the cultural context in which I just laid out that if this had happened to a foreigner traveling in a foreign land, it would not have been seen as something that was necessarily immoral. There would have been maybe other people from that person's tribe that were mad about it. But ultimately, the tribe itself, the surrounding nation, wouldn't have punished people doing something like this because it wasn't a member of our tribe or our city because it was somebody from outside. That's not something that played with God. You see, God of the Torah, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and eventually the personification, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the thing that is so radically different about them and the thing that was really first presented in the Torah is the idea of a universal God that cares about everybody that isn't tribal and that primarily cares about morality, that primarily cares about who people are and what they do, no matter what tribe they belong to, more so than what's right for them and their tribe. See, every other God before then, he was only concerned with the people whose God he was. But the Jewish God, the true God, he's a universal God that created all people and cares about what happens to all of them. And as such, the standard of morality is the same. Everybody is held to certain you know, moral principles that are universal. And that's something that really the Torah was the, only, uh, was the first to present. And it also shows how incredibly serious God takes something like rape. Because a lot of scoffers and skeptics will try to say things like, well, God was just a tribal God, which we've already debunked that. And then they'll also say, well, well, God didn't really care much about women's rights and women's consent and that kind of thing. Not true. Because this one horrible event, and, and I blame in part, and I don't think this should be overshadowed either, that the rabbi, the person whose husband she was, should have never done this and, and took a, an amazing act of cowardice for him to do so, but ultimately he is still, at least in some sense, a victim of this. That what's more important is that because of evil done, the rape of one woman, Israel starts a civil war. No, no, God took this very seriously. And these people that rose up against the Benjamin tribe, 
they consulted God and the priests beforehand to see if this was something that they ought to do, and they said, yes, God has told us that this is something not through only the law of Moses, but also divine revelation to us. This is something that must be, this is a cancer that needs to be carved out of Israel, is sort of a synopsis of what they were saying. Because in the ancient world, it may not have been a big deal, but it was a really, really big deal to God. You see, the whole point of establishing the nation of Israel is so they could be different, so that they would be something that was an example to the nations around them. They weren't supposed to be like those nations. They were supposed to be God's nation and God's people who acted differently than they did. And so by doing this, they defeated their purpose. By doing this, they became just as evil and wicked as depraved as the nations around them. Yes, this was the standard for the world and the culture at this time. It was not God's standard and never was. And that was God's point in all of this. You were supposed to be a light to the other people. You were supposed to be better than them. You were supposed to show them how to be more like you, and thus, by extension, more like me. And you failed. You became just like they were. And because of that, God saw that he needed the children of Israel to punish them and to cast this wickedness off from them. Because ultimately, it's important to remember that seeing somebody brutalized and abused like this, it hurt God because she was his child too. Didn't matter that she wasn't from that city. Didn't matter that she wasn't from their tribe. Didn't matter that this was a woman that did not have the most reputable life. She was somebody that left her husband and cheated on him and did all kinds of evil things. That didn't matter. It still didn't justify the actions that they took. God still cared about what happened to her and treated her like her life was really important. And that was, unfortunately, a concept that was lost on the tribe of Benjamin at this point because they didn't think of her that way. And that's the reason they were able to abuse her the way that she did. You know, having to invoke this punishment, having to have this civil war between Benjamin and the other tribes of Israel, that hurt God, but it was worth it because it was the right thing to do. It hurt God, and it hurt the other children of Israel that didn't want to go to war against their brothers. But ultimately, doing the right thing was more important than what was comfortable or what was easy. And I think that's kind of something that the story says to us, too. Because this is an uncomfortable story to read, especially as a modern Christian living in America. This is something that is actually in the Bible, but if you look at the lessons inside of it, it's actually pretty profound. And I think that Just like this story is uncomfortable for us, it's a story that still teaches us quite a bit. And in the same sense, in sort of a similar light, just because something is uncomfortable or countercultural for us to do in our lives today, that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Sometimes, when we have to weigh, okay, is it better to be righteous or is it better to be comfortable? we got to make that determination that it's better to be righteous and do that instead of doing what always makes us comfortable. Sometimes we have to do the uncomfortable thing in order to be right. And I think that that may be the biggest lesson that comes out of the story for a modern reader that understands how wicked and depraved this behavior was. Sometimes being God's people is very uncomfortable. I'm sure it was very uncomfortable for the other 11 tribes of Israel to have to go to war against people that they considered family. But it was the right thing to do, and so they had to do it. They had to do so to be in accordance with God's will, and to be on the right side of his justice. I think that ultimately it comes down to a question of worldview. Are we seeking to live a life of righteousness or comfort? Because if we're seeking comfort, we wind up being the Benjamites. If we seek out a life of righteousness, we become more like God. If I'm given that choice, I'm going to pick God every single time. Because obviously, picking comfort and picking what feels right in the moment, that doesn't lead anywhere good. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely.
Thank you.